Matthew, you're very, very welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing very good. Thanks for yourself. Uh, really good. Um, it's uh, autumn time here and uh, the winds are starting to kick up in in La Hinch, but um, yeah, it's it's a uh, beautiful part of the world, but uh, the winds definitely stir the old temper. So I'm like starting to get a bit, you know, gets in on you. Yeah. This is you asked me how I am, and now I'm going into a therapy <laughs> podcast about the wind. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a safe space for you. Yeah, it's funny, you know. Um, <laughs> I uh, I sometimes give out about Irish people uh, saying, you know, we ask each other how we do and how are you and we never really answer. You just the okay. agreement is you just go grand and get on with it. But like you, I, I, I often don't start a podcast with that question. And you ask me, how am I doing? <laughs> I decided to go into the whole thing. The wind is doing my head in. <laughs> anyway, yeah. you're in you're in East Clare. You're well sheltered. Yeah, we're in the in the hills of the Slivoktis, you know, the rolling gentle hills. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a nice place as long as they don't start doing too much mining up there. I hear there's Oh stop, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So listen, uh, Matthew, tell me a little bit about yourself and you know, obviously we'll get to how you ended up in Clare, but uh, you're a man immersed in music and I actually first encountered you in uh, I was living in Dublin for a number of years and I can't even remember the gig, but you definitely were part of a gig in the Sugar Club. I've no idea what it was or was oh, it a fundraiser yeah. or something or other. But anyway, you definitely um, made a mark and that I remembered your name. And then I've seen you popping up here and there. You're one of these guys that pops up a lot. <laughs> like a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> magic mushroom um so um maybe just tell me a little bit about yourself and your journey in music and where it all began right um well i was born and reared in brisbane in the east coast of australia and uh started as a guitar player actually um classical guitar and then i discovered hendrix and uh my actually my my best friends i was just remembered this now tip when you asked me where did it all start my best friends when i turned 13 for my birthday they all pitched in like ten dollars and i bought my first guitar with birthday money from like 10 of my mates you know wow like, yeah pretty fucking cool huh that's pretty good good bodies to have yeah yeah wow. so so yeah so it was guitar rock indie rock grunge you know mid 90s stuff yeah. and then yeah i guess and so but i was never really a guitar player as such, I was never really, you know, into guitar solos, or it was just just the instrument, any instrument I played. And um, I was always sort of pushing, looking at pushing at the edges of whatever I was doing, like what's what's slightly more experimental, you know. So um, I eventually got into post rock and electronic stuff and free jazz and drumming, and then I just got into everything that I was kind of interested in. And um, West African drumming at one point, hip hop country music um and then yeah the the short shortish version of the story is that then i went to india in 2003 um and had kind of given up on being a musician i kind of went there on a buddhist pilgrimage and um but music was definitely something that was still core to you know keeping the flame of my uh, inspiration alive and so yeah just through circumstance i i actually met a, my teacher um by accident on a, on a ferry um crossing the ganges i know it sounds like i made it up but um and i hadn't really gone to learn the music but i i had become a bit disenfranchised with the spiritual quest that i was on it wasn't quite bearing the fruits that i had, had hoped <laughs> and um yeah so i just kind of had this chance meeting with this amazing musician in Calcutta and um, and he was a Sarod player, which is the instrument that I mainly play now, which is a North Indian lute. Um, and so for about six years, I was just obsessed with Indian music, in, not Indian classical music. And I was spending a lot of time in India, uh, sort of half the year trying to learn how to play Indian classical music. And then eventually, um, found my way back to Ireland, which is where my dad's from. So I sort of settled here in the West. And um, yeah, still a Sarod player. Um, but yeah, most people kind of know me now for playing 
other things other than Indian music on the Sarod, which is kind of what I do since I mm -hmm. moved here. Um, I got in, got into playing Irish traditional music and then, you know, my own stuff now. So mm. that's sort of how I came to the Sarod and, and, and what I do now. Wow, that's, that's quite the journey. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it is, yeah. So um, if you just go back a little bit to when you went on that pilgrimage to India and you know, I think you talked about being disenfranchised. Well, certainly disenfranchised with the, the the spiritual part of the journey that you were on eventually. But it also sounded like you were disenfranchised with whatever was going on in music. You know that you. What what was that? Was that like was that sort of a traditional playing in bands and then trying to get a label and or or and then eventually you go, oh, what's it all about? Kind of thing or. Um. Yeah, I guess I was in, the, this was in the mid 90s when indie rock and grunge was sort of big and you know, Nirvana were like the mainstream and I was playing in bands and um, yeah, some level of commercial success was always sort of seen as the, the goal, you know, even yeah. if you, even if at the same time having creative autonomy and keeping true to yourself. So that we never really had to compromise that. That was never really part of the agenda, but still, it was still that being in a capitalist framework and not just capitalism, but being in a framework where music is something that's about that, where the, where the reward is something external to the music mm, itself. Mm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I became really disenfranchised with that more so than the music and, and also just the scene of, of rock and roll. And, and I mean, I, I still love a lot of, indie rock and post rock and and but just i don't know the 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 urbanness the um the alcohol the drugs the sort of i mean it's also the fun part of it but, but also sort of the dark side of it you know and um and and sort of the misogyny and sort of sort of macho-ness particularly in australia you know that whole pub scene just it didn't didn't really ever sit well with me you know um yeah and so that's why I sort of fell out of that world. Um, and then I never really fell into another world. I was searching for some other world to fall into that. I, I mean, I didn't, I would, didn't know it at the time, but it was only after I sort of found Indian music and only years after, not that I found it, but after falling into Indian music, it was already there. I didn't find it. Um, but after falling into it, years later, I guess I realized, you know, that what I was looking for was a music that was sort of a complete, a complete, a complete music that was sort of like um, spiritual, uh, cultural, a lifestyle, um, traditional, had this sense of tradition, weight to it, but also free, you know, incredible freedom, great creativity, um, and also a great ability, a great, um, openness for your, your own expression, you know? Um, mm. and so, yeah, for, so my encounter with Indian music was like the festival was like, Oh, here we go. Okay. This is something that's got something going on. You know, I want to, want to, want to kind of go in here as deep as I can. Um, so that's, so I guess that that's what the disenfranchisement, the disenfranchisement of the music was that I guess the, the cultural framework that I had, that I had growing up in, in, you know, urban, urban Australia. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. and then, um, <clears throat> did that ultimately lead you to, or just coincide with the, uh, quest element of going to, um, India, like, were you actively getting involved in Buddhism or was it just like, uh, I'm just going to experiment and see what's happening over here or were you, you know, yeah. quite serious about it? Oh yeah, no, I forgot about that part. Yeah. So actually I, um, before I went to India, um, I actually gave up playing music altogether. I'd sort of, um, I got into, um, I got into Buddhism through the work of John Cage, the composer. He taught, he uses a lot of Zen anecdotes for his sort of compositional techniques. And it was through that, like I kind of kept, like I was saying, kept experimenting, experimenting, and then I got into ex experimental Western music and, and the stuff, John Cage stuff. And that's when I first encountered Zen and, and, um, and this whole idea of sort of 
deconstructing that we actually have any have any power over the world or music you know mm. you know that we that we are the we are the authors of of music in in a sense and that um um and also the beauty the beautiful thing about zen and cage sort of t- touches into this is that it's all about just listening you know and and like the, the realizing the richness of sounds that we're surrounded with constantly um so that's what sort of led me to zen and yeah i'd stopped gigging actually i'd stopped playing music uh, altogether and i i took buddhist lao buddhist laos buddhist lay vows um when i was 25 and um yeah, I was really into it for about five years. I get a bit obsessed by things. Yeah. Um, so I just I threw myself into Zen for a few years in Sydney. Actually, I was living in the outskirts of Sydney in the Blue Mountains near Sydney, and I had a teacher. And I was like going to my sangha every Friday night and going to ten day retreats, silent retreats, and um, doing all the chanting in Japanese and banging gongs and kanze yon cha no no. Um. Yeah, and so I wasn't really even interested in playing music anymore, um, and that's how I got the idea for a, for a pilgrimage. Because one of the chants in the Zen tradition, um, it talks about the birth, the the five sort of holy places of the Buddha: um, Lumbini, Kusanagara, Sarnath, Bodhgaya, a couple of Atsu. Is those five, those five? It's like where he was born, where he was enlightened, where he first started teaching, where he died. I can't remember what the other one is, but there's there's five places anyway. Um, so that so that I kind of just yeah in my mid twenties, twenty six I think I got just disenfranchised with my life at that point and was like okay I'm just going to go to India and I didn't want to just go and just you know backpack around and go to Goa and you know I, I wanted to have a purpose. So the the pilgrimage was a way to sort of um, yeah guide my way around India. Mm. Nice. Um, it's it's well. I don't mean nice. It, uh, nice is such a non-word in some sense. But uh, it um, it strikes me as a remarkable thing to do in your in your mid twenties, as opposed to um, and, and, and at just a critical age, you know, because it is it's you know where the path kind of splits. You could go down any number of roads, and uh, it it really sounds like there was a you know, almost all this sense of giving up and surrendering and disillusionment or disenchantment. And then here's this dude on the ferry and suddenly Mm. things just radically change. And Mm. I wouldn't be talking to you perhaps because other than this guy you met on the ferry, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah, You just don't know when those moments are going to come. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely like being the defining um road 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 path choice of my life you know so far i think was that yeah. trip to, that trip to india and and yeah i thought i, was, I mean i kind of had a sense i knew i was going for a reason but i didn't know what it was you know and, and mm. i had this pull to go to india for a long time yeah. um and uh yeah i had, had really just surrendered to just seeing where it led me and mm. i thought i thought it was going to be six months meditating in a temple and becoming enlightened but didn't work out that way <laughs> and um so what did the uh the years after that look like then where where did you end up did you go back to australia or did you wander onwards yeah i um well i met interestingly i met a bunch of other foreigners um who were all who'd been learning indian classical music for a few years you know i was i just started and i was really lucky to sort of meet this kind of motley crew of weird outcasts a bit like me who just decided to get into Indian music mm. and and a few a few of them had been doing it for four or five years and and through meeting a few people like that from all over the world I realized oh I I could I could do this this could be a thing I do I could just you know go back to my go back home work part-time do any bit of job I can save a few grand and come back to India for as long as the money lasts and study with my teacher and just study full time, you know, sort of self-funded study, really, because um, it's really it's really cheap to stay. In. You can live really cheap in India for a long period, um, and then go back, just go back to Australia and come back and just do that, you know. Because I, I knew straight away, okay, this isn't a, you know, eight week course and you're going to master yeah. Indian yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. This this is like a life, 
and I also knew not just the life journey, but I, I knew I knew I had to spend some serious time in India, you know, um, and sort of put in a lot of hard graft and practice, just especially at the in the at the initial point because there was so much unlearning to do, you know. So yeah, so so through luckily meeting this really interesting community of of people, I I sort of managed to do that for five, six, seven years or so. Um, so not really living anywhere, you know, sort of being in India half the year and then Australia and then um, then I would, go, I would go to Europe in the summers, sometimes we'll busk a little bit um, across Europe. My teacher would go to Europe for concerts, so I used to sort of follow him um, through, through across Europe, which was amazing. It was my first time, apart from Ireland, you know, going to places like France and Spain and Denmark and, you know, with my, with my guru was like, it was pretty wild. Um, and then I used to always come back to um, Galway because my aunt lives in Frobo and my, my dad's family are, <clears throat> um, a lot of, well, they're from Galway and so there's some of them still out in the West Coast. So I used to come, I used to busk in Galway, um, great, great busking town in the summer. And uh, yeah, so that, that went on for six or seven years like that. And then I kind of got tired of that lifestyle of sort of not really living anywhere and living out of a backpack and not wearing any underwear and <laughs> um i mean you don't need kind of, to know all the details <laughs> <laughs> okay it's not that kind of podcast um <laughs> yeah so i got tired of it eventually and then I, I i had the feeling like yeah i need to have i need to have roots i need to have a home you know so and ireland always felt like home because of my my dad's irish and he always talked about it as home, so mm. it just felt like the place to come to come and settle, you know. Mm, that's interesting. And was music in your dad's family or in his life? Did you grow up with music with him, or nobody played music? But my dad, my dad's a great connoisseur of music. Um, yeah, yeah. He loves music, and uh, he has a great record collection, which I would have would have listened to when I was very young. I remember being yeah. five or six and getting up early and sneaking down to the to the to the den the den where the records were and putting on like Leonard Cohen and you know Stones records and these Beatles records that my dad Nina Simone and Did you see when you were five or six? Yeah maybe not five or six, six or seven. Wow, that's, that's pretty good yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not five or six. Yeah. But it was early primary school, I remember getting yeah. up and like put and putting on my dad's records and listening to them like yeah. So that had a really big impact on me. And um, my dad isn't musical in that sense, but he but he really he really passed on to me that beautiful that that uh, that beautiful way you can appreciate music in a total emotional experience. You know, like when he listens and talks about music, it's like you can see it's just like straight to something deep in him. You wow. know? And uh, yeah, I really saw that and felt that with him. It's like when he talked and listened to music, it was something that was really mm. meaningful, you know? Mm. Um, and so music always was something I mm. felt was really special, mm. you know? kind, of, kind of magic. Mm. So clearly there's a, a great kind of uh, lineage and heritage there for your family and, and your links to Galway and so on. But um, did you ever at any point or do you ever feel sort of split between lands or countries or how, how does that feel to be a, an immigrant essentially or a, you know you are and you aren't like the yeah. Irish there's a global Irishness that has multiple shades and but yet you know you are you are raised in another land yeah I, I used to feel more split about it I don't as I get older I don't you know um, I kind of feel like I'm Irish but I kind of feel like I'm Australian too. And yeah, that's kind of cool. Like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm kind yeah. of ha happy with that. Yeah. There's a few of you about, you know, I'm sure Steve Cooney's name enters the mix a lot. And mm. yeah, but like that, you know, there's, as I said, shades of Irishness and, and versions of it and people, Irish people with English accents and American accents and all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and the more the merrier and the, the more shades, the better as well, because it, it also brings all these different stories home and sort of the Irish music goes away and it comes back again and then it picks up a bit of Indian classical guitar <laughs> on the way and so on mm -hmm. through Leonard Cohen and 
and so yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so so Galway is clearly in the mix, and you know Galway is just a, a skip to Clare. So was it that you fell over the border one day, or um, <laughs> you got pulled or pushed? I fell over and fell into a fairy ring, and I couldn't yeah. get out. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, something like that. Yeah, I. What was it with Claire? Oh, I got a job actually in um, in Anna Steinman in the Steiner School there. All right. Uh, yeah, I know it well. Yeah, in Mullanoiga, and uh, back in two thousand and seven or two thousand and eight, and that so that's what drew me to Claire because I used to be a primary school teacher for years in Australia. And yeah, so that was that was the pool. So I lived in and around um, that part of North Clare for for about four or five years. I was teaching in Ennis Um So that was that was my first mm. pool to the place. And I, I had some friends who were living in the borough. And before I before I got the job in Ennis Diamond, I had a few friends in that part of the world, and I just loved it and, and felt loved the wildness and. Mm. Um, yeah, this is a real dynamic vibrancy around people of Clare. And there's also a lot of blow-ins too, you know, um, like me. So there's a real nice mix of people. Um, so, yeah, that was, I guess, what drew me to Clare. And then then when my partner at the time and I, we bought a house, we wanted somewhere that was sort of, uh, I was sort of also based in Limerick at the time, starting to go, I just went back to university and, she was in Galway, so we wanted somewhere in between. So Clare was mm. you know, that was that was the good catchment. So um, yeah, that's how we ended up in East Clare then. Um, and I, I, partic- I particularly wanted to move to East Clare um, because of the, the strong tradition of music there. Um, even though I wasn't playing Irish music at the time, but I but I had this feeling of mm. like music is really alive here. It's like humming, you know, it's humming in the place. Mm. So that was a real draw mm. for me, for Claire. Yeah. It's a great way of putting it, humming. It's, it's real evocative. Uh, so it wasn't long before you bumped into Tommy Hayes or was, did you, had you crossed paths before? No, I actually, um, it was when I moved to East Clare and um, I met Tommy. I mean, I know, I know Tommy's music since I was a teenager, actually. Okay. I, remember, Interesting. I remember a Stockton's Wing cassette, you know, and I used to love that cassette. I used to play it to death. And, um, I, I used to, I love the, um, like for me, like Stockton's Wing and Planksty and um, Bahi Band particularly, like, like for me, that's like, it's like, it's like rock, it's like rock trad, like the energy of it is really like, yeah, it's, it's hard, like, and like the beards and the hair. Yeah, and, it's like, gritty. Yeah. It's, it's indie, indie trad. <laughs> it's kind of like indie trad. Yeah. Like for me as a, as a indie mm. rocker, you know, I was yeah, like looking, yeah, at these, yeah. looking at an image of Stockton's Wing and like. <laughs> you know, and Sonic Youth and like there was like these they're equally as cool you know well like you know it. yeah and then like the Clancy's hanging out with Bob Dylan and all that yeah. there's a there's probably a beatnik shade in there somewhere too but I think definitely and there's a bit of radical thinking and I think in that era of traditional music there yeah. was definitely a lot yeah, of radical the rev- thinking the so-called revival or yeah, yeah. so yeah so I had, but I didn't meet Tommy um until I lived moved to East Clare and I used to do these um these uh, all night concerts, house concerts in my home. Um, all so, night. Yeah, it was, um, it's for it was for Saraswati Puja. Saraswati is the Indian goddess of creativity, and she's often associated with with music. She often is depicted with a big veena, you know. So that tradition exists in Calcutta. Or I, I experienced that when I was living in Calcutta, and um, so I wanted to keep it going. Um, when I moved to Ireland. So I just, just would invite any Indian musicians I knew and then any musicians I knew because, you know, you need to have a lot of people to have music the whole night, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I, and I knew Tommy was living locally and I just thought I have to invite, I invite, I have to invite him to one of these pujas. So I just invited him, you know, mm. and he didn't know me from Adam. And uh, yeah, he came along and we were, and then I remember, yeah, we just started playing and then we played for hours and hours and it was just, just, we just both really enjoyed it, you know? Right. Um, we're like, yeah, we should do more of this. This is fun, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, so that's how it started. Yeah. And it's, that was 10 years ago now. We're playing 10 years together. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, it's interesting how all the um, mixes get mixed up and make the magic and, uh, yeah. Um, so, so we mentioned the the puja and so on, but um, and obviously it's in the music. But does that imply that you 
have to some degree sort of moved from Zen, you've, you you know, the Japanese Zen tinge, but then you sort of left that and you took on maybe some of the Indian. I, I'm basically wondering, are you, are you a Vedic practitioner or like in terms of Vedic? No, I'm, I don't know what I am. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not a yoga guy. I'm not, I'm not really a, you know, Ayurvedic guy. I don't, I mean, I do a bit of everything, but I, I'm not really, um, I'm not really precious about any of it, you know? Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, it's, it's part of who I am, but I'm not very dogmatic about it. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of just my own, my own rituals that just make sense for me. And it's a mixture. Like I still meditate. I still have my Zen practice. That's still really valuable to me. And I, I'm not like very strict. Sometimes I don't meditate all the time, but then sometimes I'm like, Hey, I needed to start meditating again regularly. And I, I sit mm. a lot. Um, I'm still in contact with my, my teacher, my Zen teacher. And yeah, and the Indian, the Indian stuff for me is really connected to the music. So, um, the, the spirit, the spiritual aspect of it and, you know, the Indian deities and, and the rituals and prayers. Um, so a lot of that, that I've adopted for me is really connected to the music, you know? Um, and it's, I don't think you can learn Indian music without some appreciation of that. Mm. Um, and so, and some acknowledgement of that. I think it's sort of part and parcel of the music. Mm. Um, but, uh, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't actually be drawn to that spiritual practice without the music, you know, like mm. um, in terms of a, as a religious practice. For me, it's something that's act, that religious practice is, bought, is tied in with my musical practice, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, do you find out your music is still evolving? I mean, I'm sure it is, but is there any particular evolution occurring and any, you know, are you, heading towards jazz anytime soon or anything yeah well you don't kind of believe this but yeah it is evolving i'm actually um i'm actually about to release a new solo album i've made a couple of solo albums but the next one is actually an entire album of ukulele wow yeah wow. Didn't, see, didn't see that coming the did guy you? keeps throwing the plot <laughs> twists <laughs> yeah no um ukulele album and songs actually yeah that's... ukulele and songs and and but i mean when i say ukulele album it's pretty out there you know it's not it's not tiptoe through the tulips it's um, psychedelic uke yeah maybe that's we could call it that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i use i play like i started playing the tenor ukulele um a few years ago i had an injury to my left hand and i couldn't play sarod for a few months and um and i was going a bit crazy so i took i just started fiddling around with it. I, I tuned it down so it was like a sarod, you know, and started messing around with it. And I just um, just really enjoyed the freedom and also the creative challenge of playing another different instrument and uh, just different kinds of tunes and songs started coming out. So, yeah, we're doing that for a few years and I've done bits and pieces of Uke, but um, I actually got some Arts Council funding to sort of do a deep dive and just sort of just focus on like, okay, how far could I, push this boat out mm. um so yeah i've gone and made an album it's going to come out in a couple of weeks um nothing but ukulele and voice and well stuff. nothing wrong with it um eddie <laughs> vedder oh um, well, yeah uh, yeah like you know can be done it's just uh i guess it as an instrument tends to get this other stereotype associated <laughs> with it I, I guess it's somewhere between like really deep hawaiian stuff and kind of happy Californian <laughs> hippie vibes, uh, mm. but, but it's versatile. So it's not surprising that you would kind of take it and make it your own as well. So, yeah, I think any instrument, like, I mean, I think every, any instrument is like has its limitations and that's sort of the beauty of learning a new instrument. Like I, I, I like, I like challenging myself and I like having limitations, you know, like mm. I, I kind of don't like it when, I have no limitations, you know, placed on me. And there's something really enjoyable about being an absolute beginner at something again, you know, mm. it's like, Oh, and there's something fresh and exciting and mm. that discovering, well, what can I do? And, mm. um, and because I'm not approaching it, I'm not trying to play the ukulele as a ukulele player. I'm just like, how can I make music that feels good for me with this thing I have in my hands, you know? Mm. Um, and part of that was also, like part of my journey with the Sarod is 
excuse me, I mean, part of it was trying to get deep into Indian music, but also um, at some point, I guess I realized that particularly when I came back to university and started thinking about um, what it meant to be a white guy, <laughs> white guy playing Indian music, you know, and uh, I felt well, I, that that's definitely a really valuable thing to do. But I, I also wondered, you know, like, could I make music beyond just playing Indian classical music? Because that, that, that's also like, that's part of what I do, but it's not entirely who I am, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I guess like where you have popped up on my radar in recent years, I do associate you now as the Indian music guy. And right. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there's a lot more going on clearly. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that kind of is like what I mostly do and it definitely has been the biggest influence on my, my life, I would say, not just musical life, mm, but, um, yeah. Yeah. But also it's good to, I think it's good to go away from it too and come back to it. And I found that that's really beneficial. Like mm. partly that's why I got into the Irish traditional music because, and I had a different instrument made just for playing Irish music. And I found actually that was really beneficial to my Indian classical playing because I could totally go away from it and, and play something on a different instrument. And then when I came back to Indian music, it was like fresh again. It was like, oh, I'm coming back to this again with fresh ears again. Yeah, you know? I guess that's what like a lot of the Planksty and Donna Lonnie and, you know, a lot of Steve Cooney is like bringing in those other influences and freshening it up a bit. And mm. obviously there are people of a more Puritan nature that aren't overly happy when that happens, but everything has its place. Like it's good to keep things pure as well. And then mm. on the other hand, it's good to stir the pot and add some spice and flavors here and there. Yeah. Curry chips. That's what Tommy used to call what we do. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, wanted, he wanted to call the band curry chips when we first started. I was like, no, I can't, <laughs> can't be curry chips. <laughs> curry I was the, chips. I yeah, was the curry. I was the curry and he was the potatoes, you know? Oh, that's gas. <laughs> Yeah, it's it still could happen. <laughs> yeah, still could. Maybe, maybe that'll be a side project. Tell sometime. him not to give up the dream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you you've mentioned uh, university a couple of times, and you, you, I think you've got links. I'm, I'm not totally sure, but is it links with the World Music Academy or is it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Um, I came back and did my masters and PhD here a few years ago, and then I've just sort of hung around like a bad smell <laughs> since then. <laughs> And uh, eventually, yeah, they gave me a, they gave me a job. Eventually, um, so I just took over um, from Mel Mercier to run the BA in World Music. So I'm the director of World Music now, um, which is pretty cool. It's a great cool. title, isn't it? I'm the director of World Music. It's yeah, funny. it sounds. Yeah, um, like my cousin was saying, it's like that pinky in the brain episode. What are we going to do tonight? Try and take over the world of music. Yeah, yeah, you're you're in charge of world music now yeah, the, in yeah. the world. Great, all, all the music in the world. Um, um, so, so um, have you managed then? Like, obviously, it's music in an academic setting, but presumably there's an emphasis on the music. But academia has a way of kind of putting its paws and claws on things, and I'm wondering, like, yeah. are, are you you clearly are comfortable and competent in academia whereby you've navigated a master's and a PhD. So you you've managed to, you know, not lose your mind at that. And um, mm. now you're like, at what point are you now an academic versus a musician and or are you hybrid or what? what how do you yeah. see all that? Yeah, I, I describe myself as an artist scholar. That's the, the term. Yeah. Yeah, um, scholar, scholar is probably a better way than academic. Yeah, mm. and I mean, the, the, the academy is a really cool place. So this and Michal Osulovom was a, was an incredible visionary, who, and his his light still shines here. You know, mm. um, and he 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 had this vision of you know the artist and the scholar sort of working hand in hand, or or, or actually that the artist is a scholar and the scholar is an artist. That that they they're not contradictions. You know. Um, and he was a wonderful example, living example of that, you know, and how those two sides of ourselves and those two sort of roles can really speak to each other and, and really enhance each other. Um, so I've been very lucky to be in a space where, where the idea of 
playing music and the idea of thinking and talking about music are not poles apart. They're actually yeah. seen as really valuable um, you know, bedfellows, I guess. Yeah, and, and it's clear, obviously, as you said, his imprint is all over it and um, that it was ultimately the Academy was founded by uh, a musician primarily. And yeah. but but there is something in that um, that kind of art, the art of scholarship, if it is an art in its own right. Mm. And uh, and it, it certainly seems to be uh, very well regarded in terms of, you know, musical institutions globally it it has a, a reputation so it's 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 great that you've managed to keep all your various threads together as well like you're there's no kind of don't detect any great disharmony in it you know it's there's a lot of harmony in the journey if you like and even you know you're in limerick you're in claire de galway your father and um it sounds like you're arriving into a really good zone at the moment yeah feels like it yeah, I try not to think about it too much. <laughs> but yeah, feel, well, maybe don't think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But then I definitely feel like, I mean, yeah, it feels like um, a lot of things are coming together at the moment, which is really, really satisfying. And yeah, I feel like all the parts of myself are getting really nourished at the same time, you know, which is really nice. And also I have lots of avenues for the parts of myself I want to express. Because mm. I also, I also I mean, I love performing and, I love playing indie music as much as I love playing Irish music. And, mm. um, and I also love writing and reading about music and I love teaching. Uh, I love talking about music, you know, I love talking about any kind of music, you know? Um, so yeah, that I think that all feeds into all the different parts, you know, and I, and I like the, even the, the talking and thinking about music really feeds into the, the non-intellectual just playing of music, I think, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think those I think those I those ideas and conversations and and thoughts we have about music really feed into you know our bodies and how we how we express music too. Mm. Would you ever consider getting back on the indie rock saddle at all? <laughs> um I guess the ukulele album is kind of leaning back into that world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um I was always really into um I mean they used to call it lo-fi rock and stuff when i was a teenager um you ever heard of um lou barlow a band called sebado i was really into that sort of stuff in the mid 90s and um yeah it's sort of that sort of it's kind of a punk ethos where you just so, sort of is it is it anywhere anywhere near mazzy star no oh big fan mazzy star no uh, not, not quite not quite as poli as as uh, polished and, and melodic as mazzy star okay um yeah no it's sort of this it's sort of a punk ethos of just, you know, making up music in your own in a room with a four track cassette player, you know, four track recorder and, yeah. and just sort of having no limits to or having some limits, limitations in terms of having rough and ready recording material and whatever instruments you have, and then just going for it, you know? Um, and I like, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I, I got energy. it. Yeah. 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 Uh, Nico. No. Nico, yeah, maybe that. Nico one. Lou Reed, somewhere in the read. Anyway, I, I'm I'm yeah. trying to get on my references, but I I kind of get what you're saying about like the ethos. Um, uh, it, it, it's a good ethos because it's um, it's really empowering in that it it gives you sort of there are some fundamentals and boundaries there, and but it, it is basically playful and and just like get on with it, see what happens. Has mm -hmm. a kind of garage basement vibe. Yeah. And I suppose that thing that does leave a lot of people disillusioned is this um, primer around what does success look like? And it, it really it's a distorted view that a lot of particularly young folk getting involved in music are mm -hmm. guided down a, a kind of a false uh, road of, you know, what it's all about in terms of the enjoyment and the pleasure and the, the gift of music. And it's mm -hmm. sad then when a lot do give it up. Whereas it could be a lifelong journey. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for not trying to, not aspiring for, not aspiring for greatness, but just aspiring to express yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like, I like that, particularly that sort of indie rock lo fi world. I like that unpolishedness because it kind of feels human, you know? Like I like that imperfectness because mm. we're, we're imperfect. Humans are imperfect, mm. you know? And that's why I'm generally drawn towards folk music or 
or music that has sort of some rough edges, you know, because yeah. that's, that's kind of who we are. Well, as as you can see from the beginning of this podcast, I'm a very imperfect kind of guy. <laughs> I was like, I was like, shit, I'm digging a massive hole for myself. I might as well just roll with it here. It's like, yeah, I often do that. It's like, um, you know, it's well, it's podcasting or any other thing. It's uh, it's this idea that we're supposed to be this or that rather than just whatever way it rolls and. Uh, mm. And the more you kind of lean into the authentic expression, you sort of find your own groove with it. And um, obviously you don't want to make a complete mess in the process as well. But sometimes you need the, the freedom to allow yourself to make the mess. Yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah constant journey to, to be, it's good about being vulnerable, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's what being vulnerable is, is like being okay with sort of, being a mess sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Getting it yeah. wrong or, you know? Yeah. It's like when your curry chips go on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to roll with the curry go, chips. Yeah, we're going to go with this metaphor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Matthew, as we, um, we conclude, I know you have to go soon, but um, is there any, um, anything else you'd feel like, needs expressing at this point in your life <laughs> speak oh, now um geez i don't know yeah i don't think so no just yeah i mean i don't i'm not sure what the point of your podcast is i know it's like people from claire and sort of i'm not sure what the point of it is <laughs> so, <laughs> you're just sure. you're just outing me you know it's okay. just it's a complete excuse for me to just chat to people about things i'm interested in uh, okay. but yeah it's it's broadly like creative souls of claire Generally speaking, people who are in or from Clare, there's a creative bent in there somewhere, which is a broad palette. And um, mm. I just talked to them about their lives. And so that's that's what you've just done. <laughs> OK, I've done that. So yeah, achieve, yeah, achieve yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, I try and avoid, you know, give me your top 10 tip, tips for how to be creative, because uh. I tend to find that um, everyone's going to have 10 different tips a lot of the time, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of finding your own path along the way. And I, I think mm. you've definitely a testimony to that, that you've have quite a unique journey, but but everyone's journey is unique. Like Tommy Hayes is, is going to be different than, than someone else's and so on. Mm. Um, and it's great now that you're involved in education or, or have been. Well, you've always been involved in education as a teacher. So you're mm. your teaching um, background is is still cooking there, isn't it? Yeah, it's really valuable. I, I, yeah, I, I I love teaching actually, and um, I loved I loved teaching primary school for for a period. I really love working with young kids, but um, I really yeah, it feels really satisfying now to sort of take that energy and and some of those skills that I've that I've acquired, and to bring them to something that I'm really really that that makes to go back to this idea of yeah makes makes all of me sing, you know, like my whole body sings. Like when I have to go into a lecture and talk to some kids about. You know, Indian music or not even Indian music, you know, I mean, the, even this week, um, just the diversity of the students. So they had a Ukrainian student, a Russian student, uh, a Nigerian student, we have students from like Castle Troy, someone from Milton Malby, some American students. And it's like, OK, like, what's this thing called uh, world music? What's imperialism? What they had is, you know, it's like just the discussions you can have out of that, you know, it's mm -hmm. really satisfying just to think that um to think that you could have some little bit of influence over young you know young adults in their in the development of their creative minds is just such an honor you know so yeah i'm really grateful for that for the space that i have brilliant well they're lucky to have you uh, uh, yeah onwards and upwards and uh Good luck with the um, good luck with running the music of the world. <laughs> <laughs> All the music of the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no pressure. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks for yeah. the chat. Really Cheers. enjoyed it. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, pleasure.